Lou, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. I was taken out of school. Uh, I, I could not rem finish my graduation. So you were still in high school when you were drafted? Where were you living I was, at I was, I was at Edmonds in New Brunswick in Canada, right across the river for where I came, when I came back from the war. I came back to Madawaska. It's a town joined together but by a river. And uh, that's, uh, I was drafted basically also in Canada. And they brought, Were you an American citizen or Canadian? I was an American citizen, but they didn't know that because I was living in, in Canada at the time. I was an American, but I was living there. So they drafted me, and I went through all the physicals and everything else. And then just about the time they were going to say, you're in the Army, I said, wait a minute. I said, I'm an American citizen. You can't do that. They said, you are? I said, yeah. I said, so I had to prove it out. I had my uh, birth record with me, but... Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen in there, so I showed it to him. He said, well, get out of here. He says, uh, I can't take you. But I, apparently he must have <laughs> told the American side, and I was getting close for the drafting age then, and the first thing you know, I received my draft card, and I was drafted from, uh, the, the card came from Fort Kent, and he sent me to Portland, and Portland I was sworn in. And from there, they sent me to uh, Fort Devens, and uh, I wasn't training yet. From Fort Devens, they sent me to South Carolina, Camp Croft, South Carolina. When, the, when they inducted you in Maine, where did you go in Portland? Uh, in Portland, Maine itself. Oh, and that's where they inducted you, and then they sent you to which they, camp? They sent me to Fort Devens, Mass. Which what did you do there? Just uh, get, get prepared to, to be sent into uh, your training. You, okay, so you didn't actually do your basic training? Then? No, my basic training was down in Camp Croft, South Carolina. Camp Croft? Croft, C-R-O-F-T, South Carolina. And you did your basic there? Do you remember how long the basic training was? It was 15 weeks. Do you remember the date? Uh, the, the 19, I, I was in, I, I came in 1940, uh, 44, so it had to be in 44. 1944? Yeah. What was the basic training like? Basic training was a very tough place because they have, uh, they choose that particular place because the terrain was very rough and we had to be trained roughly in the, hills and mountains and trails and mud and they had it all over there uh, and uh, it was a very tough 15 weeks we uh, we, st we were up in the morning at five o'clock and uh, we we had to do almost like 12 hours a day because in the evening they had to prepare us for night combat in the daytime what we were doing like, the day, the day combat, uh, learning all about the weapons and so forth, but at night time, you have to listen to, uh, to be oriented on, uh, on how to detect sounds and all kinds of things from the enemy, uh, how to cut wire without making any noise, and it was all in special instruction. So everything was really uh, fast, because uh, as you know that uh, the Americans were dying like flies out in, in Europe at the time, and I was trained, I was going there as a replacement. So after I was, I was finished in South Carolina, they brought us back to uh, Fort Meade just for a couple of days, and then we went to a place. Where's Fort Meade? Fort Meade. Where is that located? In Maryland. And then uh, they sent us to uh, in, Ma in Massachusetts, uh, they had a camp there, a CC camp, an old camp, and they were keeping our traveling secret because uh, the Germans had spies all over and they knew when the troops were, would be sent over. But we didn't know at the time where we were going yet, but they moved, in, they moved us in from this, uh, this camp. Uh, it, 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 it was called Miles Standish. They moved us from Miles Danish 
in the nighttime, and they brought us into the uh, Boston uh, uh, area uh, port, and they loaded us on the ships, on one big ship, and off we went. You shipped out of Boston? You shipped out of Boston. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic training? Uh, there was a, I remember my, uh, my, uh, my sergeant in charge, Sergeant Veliki, his name was. He was an old, an old veteran with a lot of experience. He had been into wars and everything. So they had him picked out to train us because he knew all the combat experience. And uh, he was, uh, 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 apparently he had been in the service quite a long time then, but he had been to combat missions already. And this is what he was training us for, you know. He knew all the ins and outs, and, which was very nice. He was a very nice guy. Uh, he was very, very tough, very tough. <laughs> he didn't play around. I mean, he, when he said he gave out a command, you had to listen to it. There's no, there was no two ways about it. But we got used to it, and it was all right. It's, it's, you know, as you know, when you're inducted in the Army, uh, when they say uh, GI, I never knew why that, what GI, why did they ask, you're a GI, because we're a government issue. So this, it's like a rifle, your helmet, and you, you yourself, we're just all in the same category. So your rules are that you don't, you don't tell them anything. You don't. Ask, you can ask questions, but you don't. Uh, you have to listen to everything they say. You have to be obedient. There's no way out. That you cannot gain any, any command. It's that. That's it. And this is what you have to learn. Because when you, then they, they they tell you that you're a GI and, and you're going to be have to listen to what we say. And that's it. It ends right there. We'll tell you when to get up, when to get laid down, when to go to work, when to train, when to go back. That's the way it is. <laughs> Did you have a chance to go home before you were shipped out of Boston? Uh, I think that, uh, let me see, I believe that I did, they sent me on a, a very short furlough, which was probably about one week. All right, so I went home and I told my family that I was, didn't know where I was going, but I said, I, I know I'm going to be shipping out. And uh, I went up to Quebec to see my my other relative, I had two sisters out there, went to see them. And we came home, then I, it was, I think it was in the winter time, I took the train back to, uh, to where I left off from. I think it was from, uh, from uh, Fort Devon, actually. Cause, no, uh, the, uh, from uh, Miles, Miles Standish, yeah, from Miles Standish. They gave a very, very short time, but we had to do it fast. And then they boarded us and off we went. Now we were all on a, on a ship and we didn't know if we were going to the South Pacific or if we were going to Europe. So as we traveled and we traveled, it seemed that it was getting colder all the time. So we had an indication that we were going to Europe. Then while we were, while we were uh, crossing, uh, we were attacked by a submarine. Uh, the submarine appeared, uh, the scope appeared, and I, apparently we had two destroyers along our ship and also a, uh, a fighting plane that was keeping guard on us. And they spotted the, uh, the scope and uh, immediately they called uh, the two uh, destroyers and they went for the pipes and the, the pipe disappeared in the water, but they already, they started a fire already. There was two torpedoes coming at us, and the captain of the ship already knew that we'd be being attacked, so he was able to move the ship around in a different direction. The torpedo just zipped the, the front, just went by, just missed by a hair. Well, you got into action real quick. Yeah, and I, now all of a sudden, uh, our two destroyers started to drop the ash cans. Ash cans is like a barrel, it's an explosive barrel. They dump them down to where they think they don't have to be that close, but close enough. And they explode in the water and they will destroy the ship. Apparently, uh, the, uh, the submarine, apparently they, they made a, a good hit, you know. <laughs> they destroyed the submarine. Then we were left alone and we kept on going. 
Well, that must have been pretty scary. It was. We, uh, when you're under those particular uh, arrangements, what happens, every, see, I was in the bottom of the ship. We were, we were about 30, 3,500 soldiers on there. I was right at the bottom of the hull, and we had beds in there. The beds, everything was very, very tight. We were all, like, made out of cloth, and you just laid out. That was it. You just, you know. So uh, what happened, our commander or our, our su supervisors, they came at the door of each area, and they were standing there with a revolver in their hand. And they said, no one move. If anybody moves, I'll shoot. They were going to shoot you, because they were scared that they were going to start a panic. You start a panic in one area, it goes all the way up, you know. So we out, he says, you get, out, get in your bunks and don't you breathe. That's, so there we are, and that's all this action was taking place outside. <laughs> so finally, when they call it off, it was all set. Uh, we continued on our voyage, and I guess a couple more days later, it was really getting colder, much colder. <laughs> So now we knew we weren't going to South Pacific, and the the word couldn't leak out yet. No, I don't know why, but it was so tight it was not even funny. All of a sudden, we we appeared to uh, uh, by uh, Glasgow, that's uh, above England, and uh, we appeared in Glasgow. The big ship couldn't dock because it was too large for that. So another ship came over, a smaller one and brought us over into Glasgow. In Glasgow, we, we got into, they had the small trains that travel all through uh, Glasgow down into England. And uh, it was, the trains were, they were not fast trains. You could almost walk as fast as they, they travel. But we, all, we were heading for Southampton, England. And uh, then we know exactly where we were going because we know the next step from from Southampton is crossing, uh, crossing over to France. Okay. Uh, we crossed over to France. How long did you stay in Southampton, England, before you went over to France? In Southampton, we only stayed about three days. It, oh. it was only it was only a, a, a sleepover type thing. Uh, well, two two three days because it, it takes time to move everybody around, and then we boarded other ships over there and we crossed over to the English Channel, and we landed in, in La Havre. Now the beach was already been taken, pre not too far, not too long before that. So uh, we, we already had the foothold in La Havre, that's close to the side. And when I got off of there, they, they walked us into a, uh, a, like a temporary uh, camp. Uh, and. And then from that camp, it was just in that camp we didn't stay there at all. We just stopped over, and then they took the guys out by different groups. And I was taken out with a group, maybe what a. What unit were you in? Second division, 38th Infantry. Second division. Yeah. 38th Infantry. And uh, then I was brought over to this officer. He was a lieutenant, Holly. He came from New York, and Lieutenant Hawley, uh, he came to me, and he had been in combat. Uh, apparently, I was, I was right at the combat zone, zone, and he said to me, he said, don't talk loud, talk low. He said, I'm going to tell you, uh, he shook hands with me, and he brought me over to a foxhole, and he says, this is going to be your, your accommodation for tonight. He says, you're on the front line now. He says, from now on, he says, it's all, you don't know what's going to happen, and it's, it's war. <laughs> so you were actually then stationed on the front line? Yeah. So I got into the, uh, to the foxhole. Uh, Lieutenant Holly, what he looked like, he had a long, long beard. You, you, you didn't show no bars or no, because when you're in combat, you cannot show any of that. So the Germans don't know who's an officer, who isn't. So, and I looked at him, he was a long beard, you know, and I see his face, you know, I said, oh my God, you guys don't wash or what? <laughs> but he, he, was a nice, he was a nice guy. So uh, I went into my hole, and now I'm, st I'm, sitting, I'm standing in that hole, standing up, you couldn't lay down on it. 
he had told me that this foxhole belonged to another soldier. He already got killed, and he says, you're lucky you don't, you don't have to dig your own hole. <laughs> so I was in there, and uh, it was dark. It's, it got dark, you know, and I said to myself, what am I going to, what, where am I going, you know? I was, I was really scared, you know. I was really, I was shaking like a leaf, like, I said, tomorrow I said, I'm going to face the enemy. So while I, I'm a Catholic, and I was, I started, I was born a Catholic, and I, I believe in, a lot in it, so I, I was praying, praying, and uh, my mother had given me a rosary. I had it, in my, I always kept it in my pocket, so I took the rosary, put it around my neck, you know. And then I started praying, I said, Lord, I said, I'm so scared, I said, I don't think I'm going to be any good here. I said, I'm, I'm going to fall apart. I said, I need to have some strength. And I, I think that if you've got to help me out because otherwise I says I'm going to fall apart. And I finished my prayer and I, I, I sort of dozed off. The next morning, the lieutenant came. Now he was the day was the day was almost coming in, so he came on to my foxhole and he said, "You all right?" I said, "Yes." He says, "Well, okay." He says, "You're going to come out of there and he says, we're going to show you where we're going to." I'm going to show you how we're going to, see, you're not going to have any <laughs> any breakfast here, you're going to just give us K-rations. So he gave me the K-ration that I needed, two little boxes. Then we took off, when it got lighter, we took off on a mission. And we started to walk up further, and we were approaching a small town, and all of a sudden there was a German sniper that started to, to fire on us, so he pinned us down. How big was the unit you were with that you were marching at that well, point? Well, now we're, I, I'm in Company L with my company, all right? Company L. And each company has three squads, three squads. How big? Uh, the squads usually were about 12. If they were in full, if they were set up in full, it would be about 13, 12, 13 guys. And I was in the uh, 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 third squad, and... Uh, all the uh, uh, soldiers don't talk, say names. You don't say your last name. You're always known probably by just your first name. You never get to find out what the last name. I don't know why, but it's always been that way. And uh, I had met all these these guys, and uh, they didn't know shake hands. They didn't do nothing because uh, they could see they were tense all the time. No one, you know, they were ready to, for engagement. So anyway, this sniper kept us down, and one of the uh, first, they call first scout. The first scout was the first guy that would go out to try to find out where the sniper is. He could go around like. Now he was in a hole, and he was up on a higher ground. So he finally crawled on the belly, finally went around from the back, and then he got close enough, he threw a grenade in there, and, I, and this guy. Now we were up in the town. Now, I wasn't scared now. I don't know. I hadn't had this much yet, but I didn't know what's going to happen in this town. So when we got in this town... Do you remember the name of the town? No, I don't. It's German. The towns... Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I remember the big towns, but the, the smaller towns I never did. But anyway, was, all I can remember, we, we had to take this town over now. We know the Germans were there. As soon as we got on, on top of where we had vision of the long street, we, we saw Germans moving at, at the other end of the street. And I, I just saw a look, and when I did, here comes a hail of bullets, and I just had time to jump over, like, and it, it all went by me, and it was a building, a house right here, so I ran to the house in the back of it, and what we did... When we, when we fought in the village fighting, when one soldier would run to a house, he would definitely, uh, the other guy from behind would take cover. So, uh, if, uh, the other soldier would take cover, so uh, my helmet went off, when he fired, my helmet went off my, my head. And that bullet went, all the, they had what they call a burp gun, and when they fire a burp gun, they hit, they start from the ground and they bring it up and it goes, and you see a, 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 a burp, burp, oh. that was a German uh, submachine gun type thing. 
So my helmet went off my head. And I said, you missed, you dummy. And I, that, this was my reaction, you know. But I, I hid behind a building. And after being behind a building, all they, they could, I was not a target no more. But we were traveling. I'd cover the next, the next guy. He'd go over to that house. And then I'd run over past him and go to the next one. And this is how we took things. And apparently the Germans had done, uh, they fired a while. They decided to get out of there because they knew we were coming. So they disappeared. We don't know where they went. Well, the funniest part about being in combat is a lot of the time the, the Germans, when they saw that you were, they were too close to us, they would take all the uniform off and, and find, they probably had some clothes, civilian clothes, they'd put it on and they'd say, Polsky, Polsky. In other words, they wanted to say that they were Polsky, but they were, but they were Germans. And this was one way of, of getting out of it, you know. So we continued and did a lot of walking, uh, we walk all the time, and it was bad weather, snow, wet. You never change your clothes right away, it goes. And uh, then we, we come up to an area. Uh, then my lieutenant said, we're digging in over here. So we, we all started to dig in, and we didn't even get half the holes. Though the bunch of Germans, not too far, they saw us, we didn't see them, you know. And they started fire what they call an 88 artillery piece, which is it's the fastest bo uh, shell that would come to you. So fast, not even funny. I mean, it hit and it was there, you know. And it went over our head. When that when that came over, uh, we we do, we we heard the, the snap. I jumped for the. I had my little foxhole. I started with only half. I put my head in the foxhole with my can stick, and I don't know why, don't ask me, that was my reaction. And then the, the shell went off further, I, we were under the arc, because the shell goes this way and explodes down there. If you're here, uh, all you're gonna, gonna be dangerous is the shrapnel coming back from it and the concussion, which is a fire or the heat, that you can feel that. And when that happened, uh, we had one, one, two guys call that were hit by, by shrapnel, apparently. And see, they gave us a barrage and they stopped. And when they stopped, apparently they decided to move back themselves. So we started to look to see what kind of problem we had. So we had two guys bleeding to death, I want to think. So we were all trained to do first aid, all of us. Even, we had first aid uh, soldiers usually in a combat area, but sometimes we didn't have, we don't have them. So this time we didn't. So we we were trained ourselves. We used some kind of uh, suffocating tablet. They call it to give that to the uh, to the victim, and then we knew how to stop bleed. You know, if you had arm uh, an arm problem or leg, we put a tourniquet and stuff like that. We knew all that, so we did that. And uh, we had the two guys pretty well comfortable. They were in a stretcher. So my lieutenant come down to me. He says, "Well." Since you're, you're our newest uh, veteran, he says, uh, I got a job for you. I said, what am I doing? He says, you and another guy, but I'm putting you in charge. Uh, we're going to take one of these, uh, the worst one that's bleeding here. That's going to take him. I said, where am I going? He says, I don't know. You just keep going back. When you find American soldiers there, you turn them in. You tell them what the problem is, and they'll pick them up, and you come back. So I did that. Now we're walking with on the stretcher and we walking. We must have gone <laughs> about two miles, two, three miles anyway. And all of a sudden I see a, some movement. And I, and I tell my other partner, I says, I, well, I think they're, they're Americans. I said, you know, I says, some of our, part of our division are, are, are traveling behind us somewhere. So we, we approached slowly and sure enough it was. So I come up to this jeep, there was a, a, a lieutenant there. An officer, I, I can recognize you as an officer. I come up to him and I said, I can't salute or anything because we don't salute in combat. I told him what I, what I have. I, he said, where are you at? I said, we're up in the front line up here. So they, they were traveling behind us because it always works that way. If we were getting in big trouble, they come up to help us out or something. So <clears throat> he said, okay, so they're, t they're taken care of. I said, we have another one, another truck, couple of guys that are supposed to show up. They're not here yet. I said, I don't know what happened to them. I don't know if they got lost or what. So I went back. He says, 
you know, do you think you can find your way back? I said, I don't know. I said, I didn't know how to come here. And I said, I don't know who, how am I going back. I said, I'm only going to go, to go the straight direction towards where I came from. I did that. I, yeah, I got back about 12 o'clock at night in the dark. And I finally found out where my author was. It was hard, but I found him. I told my lieutenant. I told him what I had done. He says, okay. He says, you're all set. So the next day, we, I, now I, I worked on my foxhole a little bit so I can get in there enough and then get to where we had left here. And uh, the next day, we found out that the Germans had, they were always falling back, you know, because they knew that we were after them all the time. So, so what, what really was happening in our front lines is the, uh, our, our commanders, our d division commanders, they had everything planned out. They, what they would do, they would take a group and they would cir we'd circle the Germans out in one direction. We'd try to put them into a hole, like, in other words, a circle, and then we can come back at them. And that was very successful, that type of fighting. So everybody was doing it. And if we got into trouble, another group would come and bail us out. See? So this is uh, the way that they were fighting it. And my general that, we, that was responsible for us was uh, I had General Hodges, and I had uh, uh, Eisen, uh, Eisenhower, and I have George Patton, Mr. Patton. Well, you had a lot of big ones. Yeah. And he was, they were all our, uh, our generals. Pat only showed to us, he showed up to us before the Rhine River. We were on our way to the Rhine. We passed, uh, went across the Elbe River. Uh, then finally when we came up, we were right on the edge of the Rhine. Uh, then we had to cross, we had to cross, to cross it over. So cross, we crossed by boats at night time. And uh, as soon as we got on the bank, we, we got into another engagement. And there... Uh, now, well, this was after crossing which river? Yeah, right, as soon as we crossed the river, we got right on, the, right on the bank of it. The, uh, the Rhine River? The, uh, of the Rhine River. And uh, there was... When we got in there, there was a... a, a we saw like a building type, you know, like a camp or cottage or whatever. And we approached it, and there was dead bodies all over the place. They were all Germans that was, that was shot. So they had a, a counterattack the night before. This was a result of the last night's fight. So we, we were determined that we, we were going to take this building to stay into it, because it was better than digging, <laughs> digging the holes. <laughs> so we took all the bodies. We took two or three bodies out of the, out of the uh, building, and then the ones around, we got them out. We brought them down by, by the river, like. Uh, they had a, a way of putting them along the river. I don't know why. Maybe it was so you could find them easy. Because somebody had to come over and pick them up. That would be the people in that, the civilians in that town, would come over and pick them up and bury them or do something. So we, uh, we that night they put me on guard again. We all, everybody had to go on guard for an hour. So on my. On my hour, I had the worst hour naturally because I was a young guy, so they played one at 12 o'clock at night. So me and another guy, so we went outside, we had a little place where we had fixed to make a place to, to have some protection from, that, from the front there. It was more or less deeper from the river, enough to have, a, you know, there was woods all over, the trees. So. We were told it would be another attack that night, another kind of... The German was trying to break our lines one way or the other, you know. So, I was, I was on, that, uh, in, on that, that post that we made, and the first thing you know, I heard some noise. So I told the other guy, I says, you know what, I says, I heard something. And I said, I was looking in the area, and I saw, I saw a shadow, I'm sure. Well, he says, look, he says, we have all these grenades they had in boxes on that we brought over. He says, uh, if, we, if it happens again, he says, we're going to do something. So all of a sudden, uh, we heard some more noise. We heard some crack, you know, the witch crack, and somebody walking over. It. So this, that's it. So we started to throw grenades. Well, we threw grenades. We must have thrown about. I'd say about 20 or 25, I mean, this thing was exploding all over the place. Fam, <laughs> we just 
do them out. Then we stopped. There was no more. Everything went quiet. So my lieutenant showed up. And from, he says, what is going on here? And I told him. I says, we were being attacked. I said, I'm sure. So well, he said, let's all go back to bed. And tomorrow morning, we said, we'll put, put, we put two more guards in there to, to replace us as where our time was due. And he said, tomorrow morning, he said, we'll go see what, what happened there, where you were throwing a grenade. So, oh yeah, the next morning we went over there. It was, <laughs> there was about eight or ten Germans that were sitting in a circle and had a fire, a small fire going. And when the when a grenade exploded, they all got killed. They, they all, they're all laying out right in a, in a perfect circle type thing. So the lieutenant said, wow, he says, what a, what a night these guys are. He said, they were coming at us. He said, that's exactly what it is. He said, that's how they work. So we, again, we moved out. And the following day, there was a lot more experience that came over, you know, in different areas. But then uh, General Patton showed up around the Rhine, you know. And he put out a big speech to every soldier in, in, in our area. Did you hear him and see him? No. No, they, we couldn't do that. We, uh, he had all his, all, all our regimental commanders and the, the, the lower commanders. He had all my group, and there was there were some soldiers that were over there, but we couldn't all go there. Somebody had to keep <laughs> stay on the lines. Of them. But they gave us the news that just tomorrow General Patton had said that we're not walking anymore. We had walked <laughs> all the way from France. We was always walking. You know, on, off, off, up all the time, jump from one place to another. He says, no more walking. He says, the 9th Division, uh, we're going to be attacked to the 9th Divi Division, their 10th Division. And he says, eight, six or eight soldiers will climb the back of the, t of, of the tank. And he says, they're all, all, all the soldiers are all going to be on tanks, traveling. And he says, we're gonna, he says, we're going to Berlin. This is what General Patton was saying. He said, I'm going to finish this war. This is what they, they showed us his, his speech. He told us his speech. He said, yeah, I'm going to finish this war. He said, we're going to go home. He said, it's going to be tough. He said, we're rolling on these tanks. If we, somebody attack us, we fight them off. As soon as we get done, we're back in the tank and we keep going. He says, we, we don't stop. We don't stop for nothing. Well, we did exactly that. But in between the combat that we were having, uh, we were always on uh, the gear ration, the food. And of course, the soldiers, we, we found a way to survive besides that. You know, we, if you pa pass near a farm somewhere, we run after the chickens and we get them and we cook them. And we, we found the potatoes where they bury the potatoes. They bury them outside in the big pile for the winter. And we get potatoes, we make French fries, and we work out our ways out like that. But anyway, the, uh, once we got onto this, this tank visit with General Patton, and he was right. Now the Germans knew that they were going to lose the war, but they weren't going to give up. All of a sudden, they, they were firing uh, artillery uh, on, on us, I mean the big guns. And the shrapnel was flying all over the place, it was terrible. So we were traveling on the tanks, and the shrapnel, we were laying down like this on the tank, and you could feel the shrapnel going by pieces. And then we stopped one time uh, for a pause, I guess, and see if this thing would quiet down. And one of my lieutenants in the tank that was driving, he opened the top part, the door, and to, to come up to look. And the minute he put his head out, a piece of shrapnel got him. So he, he fell over, so we had to go over, pull him out, go get him down. And we laid him out on the ground. He was dead. And we he had his rifle, his stuff, we, whatever he had, we put it right next to his body. And the medics usually travel from the back of us, the back of the lines. And they pick up the Americans that were. We leave, if someone got, got killed, the, the thing to do, we would take the rifle and the bayonet and we'd stick it right to his head, like right at the end. And uh, we would sort of put or something over him, and then the medic, would, the medics would come over and pick him up and they take care of him, dead or alive, whatever. Uh, then we 
we ended up by uh, we were traveling and traveling, and it was terrible because they were throwing everything at us. And finally, when we approach, uh, we're getting into the bigger towns there, the bigger cities. And I come up, we come up to Frankfurt, that's uh, one of the big places. And uh, so now we we're into the cities, and. Everything was beautiful in there, you know, all the buildings. The, 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 and we we knew the war was almost over, so we didn't ask for... When we were in trouble, we always called back to ask for the uh, airplanes to come over, to bomb something in front of us, stuff like that. So we didn't want to do that. So uh, then my lieutenant says, he says, yeah, I said, we, we don't, we're going to destroy these houses. He said, these are our landmarks, he says, in Germany over here. So, so uh, we sort of walked through there and, and cleared all the areas that we thought there might be somebody hiding or whatever. And uh, then we got done with that one, we went to another, I think it's a time on the Queso or something, I can't remember all the German names, but we passed another big one. And up, up further, and then we became on the edge of uh, Germany, uh, Berlin. And at there, they, uh, every group somehow seemed to be coming in to Berlin. On the other side was a Russian coming that way. And uh, then uh, one of my commanders says, well, we can't stay here. He said, I just got a message that he said, the war in Berlin here, May the 8th, well, was supposed to be over. The, the, the Hitlers, they found him dead and everybody surrendered and so forth while we were there. But he says they're still fighting going in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia is very close. Did you know that Hitler had committed suicide? We didn't know at the time, but we found out later that he did. Yeah. Uh, they, you, they tried to, they, their own officers tried to commit suicide, and they, to kill him or whatever. They tried to kill him and they failed. And then the next time, uh, he had a place, I believe, in the high mountains somewhere, uh, with his uh, Eva Braun, uh, his, his wife or whatever. And uh, I think that he, he, he committed suicide in that in that place. So this officer told us, he says, my our group, he said, we have to go to Czechoslovakia. The war is still going on down there. They're still fighting. So they made us, they called military government. It's like a, 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 a police for the government. He named, we were probably about 50 of us guys. He said, we're going down there and we're going to finish that, see what's going on. So we started off, we come into Pilsen and uh, we stayed there one day. We, we didn't go, we didn't dig any holes anymore. We had plenty of buildings there. We just asked the people, you know, we were living in a duplex, move them over and we take half and stay in there. And we told, they know that the war was going in, in, uh, in the next town over. Uh, and uh, so we stayed there that night. The next day, we organized, and now we're going over to the next big city, Prague. We went to Prague. That's where the fighting was going on. Now, we expected to really get into combat, but as soon as we come into Prague, all of a sudden, we, the, the Germans, we start out, out to go out of the city limits, and we're on our way to see what was what, see if we could find somebody to, to, to fight us, I guess. And all we saw were thousands of guys coming towards us with their hands up, hands over their head. They were all Germans giving up. So once we got them, we went right among them and started to question them. We, had, we always had somebody in a group that could speak the language. I could speak French, so I had no problem with that. And they used me a lot for the French to translate. And then they had guys that knew how to speak German and whatever, and, and uh, Polish. So uh, we talked to one of them, and he said that the Russians were coming at them from the other side. And he said, we would rather be captured by the Americans than by the Russians. They didn't like the Russians. Nobody liked the Russians for some reason. So we took them all in by the thousands. So that more or less was the end of the war there because uh, Berlin was already taken over and we finished this part. So now they took, off the 50 guys, they took about 
about 30, 30 of them, and they, they went back to another place somewhere. But they kept us guys. They wanted us for some reason. They had us figured out. First of all, they asked for volunteers to stay over. And my group volunteered. We, ne we never liked the volunteers because you, you don't know what you're getting into. Yeah. Well, you have but we, we, volunteers? we volunteer anyway. Just, just being nice guys. So again, uh, this officer shook him up to us. He says, look, he says, here's what we're going to be doing here. We're not fighting anybody. The fighting is all over. He said, we get concentration camps here. There's people in there. And he says, we have to go take care of to give them protection, take care of them. And he says, we have to, all these people that are in this camp, they have to be, we have to find out why they were there and how the, the Germans treated them. These were ammunition places where they were making ammunition for the Germans. And they, they stayed in this camp and their, 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 their shop where they were making, making the ammunition was a little bit further. So they worked them a lot. With, they had, one camp was all women, all women in there. And the other camp was uh, Jewish ladies, and they had also some men in that camp. And these were in Czechoslovakia? Yeah, but the, the Jewish could not get along with... Now, the people who were in a, the, the first camp, they, were, they, come from, they came from Germany. Some German people that were, didn't want to get involved with fighting, they captured them. They came from Belgium, they came from France, they came from anywhere, and they just take them and bring them over, they, you know, arrest them and bring, put them in the camp, and say, so you're going to have to work in here. That's what they were doing. And they stayed in there, and uh, they put us in charge of the, the camp so nobody would bother them. That It was always other men coming over, they wanted to go in, but they knew there was women there. You know? <laughs> so we, we stood at took guard and nobody could cross over where we were. It was simple as that. Do you remember the name of that camp? It was in Holisov. Just the name of the town that was Holisov. H-O-L-Y-S-O-Z. V or Z on the end of it. Holisov. And the uh, then my, the officer, my officer that, that was in charge of us, he says that next week is we're going to start to talk to these people individually. And he says, uh, you, he says, Mr. Myers, we understand you speak French. He says, you're going to have to help us interrogate the, uh, the girls from, uh, the woman from uh, Belgium, a lot of them speak French, and the one from France. He says, uh, you're going to become part of the office here where we're going to give them, you know, we'll take each one at a time. And when you, the, one, the group that you're going to fit in with will let you know when you say we're going to take them all in one time. It says after we get done with them, we get all the information that we need, we're going to send them back home. Well, he says, we, ha we take our trucks, we load them in, and we give them K rations of food to work with. It. Send them back to where they come from. I was talking with those people, the Frenchmen from Belgium and from France, and they said, well, you know, said, we're going back, but he says, we don't know what's left in those towns, you know. A lot of the towns were, were uh, had been bombed out and everything else, and their parents were, got killed, whatever. They, don't, they didn't know that. So they were worried going back. Because when I passed through Atkins, when we crossed, we got, we got involved in the, Germany, the beginning of Germany, Atkins was leveled to the ground, and that was a city much bigger than Hartford. I mean, maybe four or five times as big as Hartford. They was leveled up to the ground. Always left with a church with a hole at a peak, you know. A, a, a round uh, had gone through it, but the peak is still up there. That's all I was left at, at that church. The rest was all we had to bulldoze our, our way through to get through there. But anyway, uh, after the camp situation, uh, what we did, uh, the, we made sure they had got them proper clothes, and then uh, to, to to travel with, and we put them on the truck and we sent them home. We emptied the camps. Then my officer told me he says. Uh, I want you to come with me, he said, well, two or three of us. We went to see the uh, the place where they were making the ammunition. So we wanted to see what was in there. So we went up there, and, and there was still a lot of ammunition left around and all this stuff. So they caught him, we caught them with their pants down, so they left everything as it was. And then we left, when we left, we went back to the camp. My officer says, I was a bazooka man. You know, uh, the bazooka came very famous. You were a bazooka man? 
I, we, we, I was everything because when, when you start, the, the guy gets knocked off. You got to take over his responsibility. So it's always a deal like that. So I was like, uh, first I was a rifleman. Then the first thing you know, they put me assistant bazooka man. I was assisting the guy that had the bazooka. He got killed. So they make me the bazooka man. Then they make they put they make me a, a first scout. That we the first guy going out in the lines. I had to get through that. So uh, all the functions that took place in my squad, eventually I had we all we all did them. It was, and it was easy for somebody to get hurt, and then they take him out and send him back to England and this and that. So, but we didn't get the replacement right away because I came as a replacement. There was only six guys left in my group. I was the seventh one, you know, you know. And right away, I was carrying on my back over a hundred pounds a day, with my with my, my with my canteen, with my my belt full of uh, uh, ammunition, with the. Uh, with, the, with a shovel hanging on the back of me, my bazooka, and then when we had a bazooka man, he carried the rounds, you carried the bazooka, the bazooka man carried the bazooka. Now when the guy got knocked off, I took over the, the thing, there was nobody to carry the rounds, so I had to do that, I thought of that. So out of that, I came up, I came back home with three vertebrae touching together in my back. So I've been suffering since then. And my legs, my legs, I. I usually wear, I didn't put my brace on today, but I, I wear braces all the time here. They're metal braces, and uh, this, my legs are bone to bone, you know, the, they won't operate now. Because I, I take Coumadin and they're scared, they said I would probably, uh, would have a stroke right on the table if they operate. So you're better off to keep walking as much as you can. When you can't walk no more, then 50-50 chances are okay, you know. This is what I got out of when I come out. Then I lost. When I put my, when I was in that hole, I lost consciousness. Uh, everything went black, but I didn't. I, I came back. Not too. It didn't take too long. I came back. They pulled me out of there, <laughs> and uh, I felt my face was had been heated, uh, and my eyes were. I didn't see quite right, and uh, then I had ringing in my head that I could not stand. It was terrible, and I thought it would always stop, and it never did. Till this day, I, yeah, I still, still have. Ringing? Yeah. When, where were you in that foxhole? Which foxhole was that? Well, that's what. When, when, when we, uh, that's when we. I was telling you on that part that when we we came up uh, to secure this place, and then the Germans saw us, and they start with, they they start with the 88 uh, artillery pieces, and they fired on us, and uh, we weren't even ready because we were digging. We were just start digging in. And halfway through the hole is when they opened fire on us, and we all tried to take cover, and we had. <laughs> this is when you went in head first. Yeah, I put my head in first, but you know, the concussion of the artillery piece was so strong that even being in that hole, it had an effect, you know. And it took me a good after. Well, after that, the the. the it took me uh, maybe about a half hour anyway. I would say that I was like I lost. I, quit, I didn't know what was going on. As soon as I came to, all I was is that my ears was ringing, my eyes were kind of blurry a little bit, and then uh, I, I felt kind of heat on my face. And then not long after, my lieutenant told me he said, "Wait, somebody got hit here." You know? Then now all of a sudden, <laughs> it seems like hey. The guy gets hit and he's dying. I said, I'm not that bad, you know. So I got to, so then he asked me, he, he, he said, you said you would be able to take this guy out? He said, he said, I need to have you. I said, yes, I will, no problem. I said, I, I can work it out. I said, I'm getting a little bit better here all the time. So, uh, but the ring had never left me. And you know, the worst part of it is that even when I came back home and when they stopped telling us that we, when we came back uh, in, Camp, in Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, when we came back from Europe, and then uh, they sent us home. They gave us a furlough. No, not right away. We went, we went to Texas. 
They put us in a camp in Texas. Once we were in Texas, we were all set up. Then we went home for a furlough. Then when we came back, they decided that war was still going in Japan. So we came, I came back from the furlough. We came back to Camp Swift, Texas. And uh, we uh, stayed there a while, and they were going to train us. They were going to send us to Fort, Fort Lewis, Washington, and they were preparing us to go to Japan. The war was over in Japan yet. And then, that was in July, then... What year, 45? Yeah. So the, uh, what they said, I got 46, actually. Because I, I was a child in 46, so it was a little before, it was in for, uh, the beginning of 46, I guess, it was in Texas. And they, uh, they were gonna send us to Fort Lewis and then uh, they, they said the war was over because they dropped the bomb. And it's, now they didn't know what to do with us. You can't send them to Fort Lewis. They're going to be, have to be discharged anyway. So they decided they were going to discharge us. Now when they, they sent us to Fort, Fort Dix, New Jersey, that's where I was discharged. And when I went through the medical, they asked, they asked if you have any problem. And I told myself, I had two problems. First of all, I says, I, while I was in uh, the last camp, was Camp, camp Swift, no, Fort Carson, Colorado, because we left uh, Camp Swift, we went to Fort Carson, Colorado. That's where they, we left. Then we went to uh, Fort Meade to be discharged. While I was in Fort Meade, I had to be operated on this left leg. And they, they looked for shrapnel, a piece of shrapnel or something. So they opened, they opened me up in the back here, and they made a slit, and they went in. They, they dug out something. And then, when I went back to my unit, my first sergeant says, "I he says I can't put you in training." I said, "Why not?" He says, "Because you had you've been operated on, and you're still you're not even well yet, and you're you're here in front of me." So I said, "Well, what, what, what's going to happen to me?" He says, "I'm going to send you to the uh, officers." Uh, barracks. I'm going to assign you to the uh, officer's barracks. You're going to be like an order, orderly. An orderly is a cleaner. <laughs> I took care of three of barracks. He says, I can't keep you in training anywhere. And what base was this at where you were the orderly? Fort, Fort Carson, Colorado. And I was operated there also. Oh. Fort Carson, Colorado. So well, then when I was sent in, to, I stayed there for you know, like maybe three months or so. And all of a sudden, they said we were going to be discharged, so they sent us to Fort Devens. And when I came to the last medical, I told them, I says, uh, I was operating on, in, uh, in Camp Carson, and I says, uh, I was, I was, uh, I, they wouldn't let me in, in training anymore. So I said, there, one of, I, said I had a leg, a leg problem that I was operating on. And I said, I lost. I lost some hearing, I'm sure of it, because I already know when I said my head is ringing like crazy all the time. He says, the, the medical guy says, well, look, he says, <laughs> you just come off the front line. He said, what do you expect? He said, in no time at all, he says, uh, maybe a couple of years down the line, he'd be all right. So they put down on, on, my, on my, uh, my last report that my hearing was okay, but it wasn't, you know. So I came home. Uh, go on to when you came home. Go back to when you were going to those camps. Did you get an opportunity to speak with any of the uh, forced labor, the women that were in the camp that you? Were? Yes, I did. I talked to uh, I talked to a lot of them, the French ones. Uh, they all told me that we're pretty near all the same stories. They said we're going back in our town where we came from, but we had word that someone was was raised down to the ground by the bombs and everything else. So we don't really know what, what we're going, and we don't know what's going to happen when we get there. And we told them, we said, well, we, all we can do is to get you, make sure that we get you down there in your town, and then you'll have to take it from there, because you're home. The war's over. So we explained that to them. And, uh, Did they describe what it was like working in that room? Oh, yeah. Camp? They were beaten all the time. They were, uh, they were starved a lot. Uh, and uh, 
they, they were kept behind barbed, the, the camp was surrounded with barbed wire and everything else. They were real, they were, they were real, uh, they, they, there was a lot of, every story that was said there, um, I know it went to the, uh, uh, to the big trial they had in Nuremberg, and this is what we were getting out of the people. So the, to, be, they had the officers captured that was responsible for those areas. But what they needed to do is to build their cases on them. And this is what we were doing in, in North Carolina, concentration camp. And when I came to Germany, well, I, I didn't put into that part, but when I came to Germany, I also, we were also came to the concentration camp. So we were there for a few days and just, you know, we, we didn't go there basically to, uh, to, we didn't know what we were going to do. We just, Which camp concentration uh, camp? This one was, uh, let's check if I can remember the name of it. Uh, Something with Oshwald, but no, 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 no. Auschwitz? Bush, Bush, uh, I can't remember the, uh, the name. I, I did remember the name a lot, but I, it's been so long that I... Uh, uh, it was, uh, there was, the camp that we were in, it was men, a men one anyway. And there were guys that were starved. Oh, you could see the ribs there. They were still laying there. And there was, uh, Every, every every man that was there, he wouldn't be there long. He'd either die or starvation or whatever. Uh, why can't I remember those camps? And we just went in, and then they took us to another camp where they had brought the women in there, like, and where they, they had a place. It was a camp. This is where they were getting rid of them. They had furnaces down in the, the lower basement. And they would let them take showers, and while they were taking their showers, walking, they would, they would tell them they were going to do something special, whatever. Then they they sent some kind of a gas in the shower room, and that would drop them all off, and they'd take them and put them in, in the ovens. And that's, that's the way the, the Germans were getting rid of them all the time. And that camp had another name. I, I don't remember the name of that camp either. And uh, that was the saddest thing that anyone could see the way that those men were in those camps, you know. No clothes, you know, and they're just ribbed in their eyes, you know, their faces were all right to the bones, their eyes. And it was so scary. Like, I never forgot that. Uh, the, all it is anyway, after my discharge and I'm back home, uh, I came back to Madawaska, Maine, where my wife lived, and she was born in Santa Gat, but they had moved in Madawaska. And I started to court her and finally I decided to get married. Uh, didn't have much money because they gave us three hundred dollars to get out of the I must run pay that and the uniform, that's all I had when I come out of there. While you were still in the service, were you awarded any medals or citations? Yeah, those those were all the medals that I won on the battlefield. The the way that worked that my lieutenant is the one that uh, decides, uh, like when you become, uh, uh, I have the infantry co uh, combat badge, which is that one. That's when you actually go into the service in action. If you see one of those, like this, this guy has been in action. And That's these infantry combat. Mm -hmm. and, and these other medals here, they all represent uh, the areas that you fought into. This is a good conduct medal. This one is a Bronze Star. This is a very high honor. Uh, my lieutenant gave that to me because of not just one thing. Many brave acts that I committed, is, they kept them all. And then he recommended me for the Bronze Star. And it came, when I came back from the service, uh, all of a sudden, a year later, all these medals came to me. Uh, I have the other ones here. So you didn't actually get them until after you were discharged? Did you know you were going to be awarded them? No, I, I didn't. You know, when I, when I came home, I came home. I was just a private class. I knew that I, I had this badge here, that I wore that. And all of these, I hadn't put them on yet. But there is one here that... Uh, this one here is Europe, this particular green one, and it has two two little stars on it. This is what uh, represents the presidential citation that was given by by the uh, by by the president of France, World War One, World War Two. 
But as long as you were in World War II and you fought on their place, uh, you could wear the cluster, the little cluster for the World War I, and the next one is for World War II. Now, I got a certificate I could like to show you later on that was sent to me by the president of France, a citation because uh, we liberated their country. And it was a high honor. They call it a diploma or something like that because it's, it's, it's almost like a French thing. And uh, I also have uh, a, le uh, a letter from, uh, uh, from Truman that, uh, in there that's, that was given to me from them with a signature on it. And uh, what else do I have? Uh, but all these other, I have all, they, all these ribbons here, I have a medal that matches it. I have a medal for it. So th that's why we only wear that on the outside. And, uh, Lou, let me ask you some questions about um, what daily life was like while you were in the infantry. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were overseas? Well, I, I tried to write many times, and I, let's say out of, they probably received two letters from me out of maybe ten, ten times that I wrote because the mailing situation it was didn't work out <laughs> because it's had to go to the front lines all over and it's so the letters in fact I had as a soldier as we fight you know like I took a pistol away from an officer we cap I captured him I took a, a pistol as a Luger they call it. And I, I, I was, and I also had a, a Belgium 32 revolver that I saved. That's the only two things I saved while I was there. Uh, it was very dangerous because if the German ever catches you with that particular revolver, what they would do, they'd put that gun on your mouth and they would fire it. They'd kill you right on the spot just because that you did that. that this is how, look, I, had t I told you that I had 15 weeks of training. I went to, we went to fight, and I said, I said, we went to fight Germans. They had 15 years in service. They were all specialists. And this is the kind of guys we, the Panzer Division, and also the, uh, you had the Panzer, which was very bad, and the other types here, the, um, oh my gosh, yeah. the Panzers, and the SS. The SS, those are the two worst. They would never give themselves up. They would rather be killed or they kill themselves, one or the other. Because one day at one of these operations in between there, we were at a location, and I, this is when I was introduced to the bazooka that I had to use it. And my lieutenant showed me a house. He said, see that brick house over there? And we just came in there, and they already knew that there was Germans in there. He says, you got to drop that house down. And I said, how? He said, what's your bazooka? You can put a run and fire it. Bang. But before, we're going to give them a chance. We're going to see what happens. We know the Germans are in there. They're bad ones. He said, they're the, they're the SS. Uh, yeah, the SS. All of a sudden, we saw this man come out on a porch with a white flag. So he was an officer. He wanted to surrender. From behind, Somebody shot him, one of his own guys shot him, and he fell down. And that's when my officer, my officer lieutenant says, drop that house now. So I fired the first shot, and then about half of it that went down. I fired a second one, and I got that pretty well. Nothing was going to move on that way. And the reason why I say the bazooka became a very important thing in those days, because we had an awful lot of hard time with the tank tanks earlier and as soon as we found out that we could use our bazooka to fire in in that the big track that goes around we could hit that then they would have to stop they couldn't go any further and then they'd have to pop out of there so this was always a, the good thing with us so before they tell me that I, I see it happen the guys would try it to crawl onto the tank, even if it was going too fast somehow, but they tried to manage to get onto it and try to get, try to get the, the hole open and try to get some, uh, they knock off something, they do something to try to attract the guy. They didn't, they, 
they get get off and throw that thing in the back of it where all the the uh, smoke and the crap comes out of the back of the tank like they throw it onto that and they try to they make it uh, damage it from the inside. A lot of times it works, sometimes it didn't. But the best way is to stop it. When they were stopped, you know, sooner or later they're going to come out of there. <laughs> we weighed them out. <laughs> so, uh, well, all right, so not many of your letters got through. Did you get any mail from home, or was that just as bad? No, I never, I never got mail while I was in combat uh, because the mail was just, I wrote, to my to my sister, I didn't know my wife then. I wrote to my sister, and uh, I never got any answer back. She did, and she told me later that she never got my letters. So it wasn't it wasn't working very well as far as mail for my, for my times anyway. Uh, the only news we ever had is, is, is you probably heard of Ernie Piles. Have you ever heard of Ernie Piles? And he, uh, he used. He was in combat with us. He, he just followed us all the time. You know, all he was doing, he was a reporter. He he marked down everything that took place, and he, he probably he reported back. They had the paper they called Stars and Stripes. This was the only paper that ever came on the, that we could get our hands on. We get one copy, and probably twenty guys would would share it. And it was all the stories that they would find, and then they could tell us news from back home. How we were doing with the war and blah 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 and stuff like that. But uh, that was about the only communication uh, that we that we could get. Um, it's not like uh, they were uh, they they didn't try to give you those, those kind of stories to make you feel uh, that you, you know to make you sad or anything. So they, we just ignored that. We just did. They had mail call. I don't know how many times I went to the mail call. I always thought I'd be getting a letter, but they was never there. So I got used to it. I said, hey, we're in the war. So what are you going to do? So I walk away from that. What was the food like? The food, all the time I was in combat, uh, I was eating with, on a K ration. I had so many of those. There was a, a, a breakfast. What is a K ration? A K ration is a little box, about a little bit bigger than a Cracker Jack box. And in that box, you would have a little can that could be uh, meat, uh, spam, it could be uh, cheese, and I had a little pack of crackers, I had a little pack, flat pack, two or three cigarettes, I had a, a, couple, a, a couple of sticks of gum, uh, and then I had a candy bar that was hot as a rock, and what you would do is, we, well, we used to take that, we try to heat it up with water and try to make cocoa out of it, but it came out lousy, but it, at least it was something. So, but I had a breakfast a box and a dinner box and a supper box, a three box a day. So, but they were all set up a little bit different. So what we would do, we had the breakfast one had like uh, scrambled eggs mixed with ham, but it was in a little can. Uh, what we would do is, uh, <laughs> we get sick to eating the same thing all the time, right? And you couldn't, you couldn't smell it, you, you, you just assume not eat. So we'd ask another guy, but we would eat one of the other box, one that we liked the best. So we would trade our box among ourselves. So, so I'll trade you a breakfast for dinner. <laughs> so we kept going with that, and then we started providing our own. You know, like I was saying, we learned that that they uh, in Germany, particularly uh, in, in uh, Czechoslovakia, they always put the potatoes in a mound, and they, they put hay over it for the winter. They knew that the outside one would freeze, but as you dig into the the pile, you get to the good ones, and we'd get those, and we, then we had a guy that was following us, he was, he was from a, a soldier from the French army that debanded because they all fell apart like, so he had no place to go, so he was staying with us. So he was cooking for us, he was making us french fries, you know, and we kept him for that reason all the time. But every once in a while, in combat, I have to tell you this, this is, we didn't, Get this starved with the boxes. We weren't starving, but I mean, eat boxes. Every once in a while, they'd take us off the lines for a rest. We'd come back with long beards, unshaven. We hadn't, haven't changed our clothes. We had the same clothes every day. We'd sleep in them and so forth. We had to have showers. They'd take us, would strip us down. They'd have a place in the back line, you know, a couple, maybe 40, 50 miles away. We'd go down there, they'd make all of their rent, and they put us all through, give us all new clothes. They didn't give your old clothes back. You just put new shoes, new pants, new, <laughs> the whole nine yards. Get you all dried up, 
and then after another day, they feed you a good meal with the kitchen there, or the real, the real stuff, and back to the lines. And that's the way it worked. And we probably hit that. I probably hit that kitchen maybe uh, four times. In the, probably every four times we hit the kitchen. The rest of it was always a sea ration. And even when we got back, when the war was over, and they were bringing us back, they brought us back to France, and they they had made camps out of their tent, and they they call them old gold, lucky strike, and they were all named after cigarettes, and they were tent camps, just to bring you in there, and get you all set up before you get on the ship. Which and, one did you go to? Uh, I was in Camp Ogle, and they all look alike. They're all big, huge tents, and uh, you had a, you didn't sleep in a bed. You slept, you slept on a on a ground with your with your own stuff, you know. Uh, but it was only for a couple of days, and they they uh, at that time I had my, my mustache. I'll always remember this. And uh, now they wanted us to go back to regular routine when we were back in the states fall in line in the morning and, and, and be all, they give you inspection and this, this, this crap, you know. So we had, we had some lieutenant that just came from, from the United States and he, he joined our group and we're all combat guys, you know. So we were at, at a position where we say, hey, we're not going to listen to this guy, you know. So we thought we had authority because we were supposed to be guys that went into combat and did a lot of, a lot of struggle. <laughs> we were supposed to be the, the rough guys, you know. So this officer came up to me and he looked at me. He says, uh, "He was a, a second lieutenant in the United States. We, we called a green lieutenant because he was no." He says, uh, "How long you had that mustache?" I says, "Well, I says I had beard on my face all, all the time, and I said, I wouldn't cut the mustache." Well, he said, "You're going to have to cut it now." He said, "Nobody can have a mustache." He said, "Before it." before you go back to the United States. And if you don't take it off, he said, you ain't going back to the United States. <laughs> he said, the next time you fall out, he said, you, you better have that out. No. I stubborn, I said, no. I went back the next time. I, he, he, he came to me again, and I said, look, Lieutenant. I says, a mustache is legal. I said, you say it's not, and it is. And I said, I don't want to cut it. He said, you won't go back home. I said, well, I'll stay in France. I, said, I can speak French. So now, I was trying to call his bluff all the time. So finally, my, my captain, my own captain, that he was he charged me while we were in combat. He came up to me and he's, he said, Louis, he says, you've got to curl this off. He said, get that. This guy's driving me nuts. He said, that lieutenant, <laughs> you were somewhere assigned to him. He's driving me nuts. And he says, uh, he keeps coming back. And you don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. He said, will you do it for me? I said, yes, I'll do it for you. So I shaved it off. Like, so then, not long after, a couple of days later, we, we come up on a, on a big ship, and we're on our way home. And everybody, now we're all, now on the boat, on the boat, all that took place, we were, I think it's about a five-day trip or something. Everybody was exchanging things, you know. And guys were playing cards, they were gambling, and they were selling revolvers, and it was like a, a tax sale all the way through. <laughs> Did you bring those two guns that you Yes, had? I did. I came back. I, I, had, I had my uh, Luger for a while. And I, I was, not long after I got married, but my brother, one of my brothers lived next to me. And he, he had been in, in, uh, in the Canadian Army. Two of my brothers were serving the Canadian Army. They were Canadian, basically. The half the family was born in the United States, the other half in, in Canada. He had gone into uh, Sicily, but he came back and he didn't have any think to show for it. And he had his eyes on this uh, Luger. And I was, I wasn't scared because I, I knew about firearms. I, I, I could take anything apart and firearm, put it back in, in the bat of an eyelash. But I was thinking the killings and the this that takes place and all that. And all that. I was not well when I came back from the service. Uh, I used to go to bed at night. And as soon as I fall asleep, my wife could tell you that. The first thing I I jump out of bed. It's like a, I'm a scare, you know. And it would take 10, 15 minutes to get back to, to my composure, you know, because I was having a bad dream. I was back in action again, you know. And that went on a lot. And uh, what? Did you get help from the VA? 
Oh yeah. In fact, I'm I'm going pretty soon. I'm, they're going for evaluation uh, because that I experienced that particular thing, and it's, it hasn't left me because now it's not so bad because uh, it's just like a person that has a nervous breakdown. When he gets out of that, uh, he he has attacks or so often, and, and as time goes along, it keeps spreading out, spreading out, spreading out. The first thing you know, it's okay. So that's it had never left me. Uh, Do you still have nightmares? Oh yeah, uh, but they're not as, as as bad. But I'm I'm right into it, and uh, I, I don't I'm not sweating or jumping or doing all those particular things. But I do have the nightmares, and uh, I I'm well. I really wake up after a while, and I won't want to go to sleep because I I got too scared apparently. And I want to calm down. So I'll watch television a while to get my mind away from it. But I I get them maybe. Once, maybe every five or six weeks, I, I get those kind of like that. So I did. They questioned me this week. I'm in Springfield at the at the my primary care doctor was asking me uh, on a question. She says, "When you came out of the service, she says, does that bother you?" I says, "Yes." I says, "Everybody gets bothered." I says, "You have to. Uh, they they don't know what." kind of reaction that a soldier that's been in combat is going to have when he gets put back with a civilian. They don't know that. Some say he's going to be all right, and some says no. Well, the results are that a lot of our, our veterans came back and they, 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 they were drinking, they went to dopes, they went to everything, and until they get, they get lost, they don't want to go to work, they're on the street. There's still a lot of those. Those are the kinds that went through there. But with me, uh, what I I always been a fighter, even though I was going through all these nightmares and everything else, uh, I knew what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be an electrician, and I was. I had learned that job. When I came back, to, my job was there for me at this mill, and they were glad to have me back, and they respect me as a veteran. They made me welcome, and uh, I all the time. When the medical nurse checked me out, she took, she found out my back problem. She found out my I was operating on a leg. She knew that, and she she knew about my hearing. She said, "You know, Mr. Myers, she says we're going to take care of you over here. Anytime you don't feel right and all, you come down to see me." And they they put packs in my back, heat and all this stuff. They did all kind of numbers for me. And then when I came to Connecticut, that all came down with me, you know, that information. So they they told me the same thing. They says. We'll take care of you while you're working over here. Uh, when did you come to Connecticut? In 1951 or two, 51 or 52. And they did take care of me, but they knew what I was. But the VA would not accept those things when I filed, you know, and they kept rejecting me, rejecting me. It wasn't until 1996 that they connected me for my back and my leg. My hearing, they kept telling me that, they said, that in your record it shows that when you went to the last physical, that there was nothing wrong with you. I said, well, I, I told, the guy told me, it's not on record actually, that's what the problem is. The guy told me that, uh, I told him, he said, nothing you can do, he said, it's gonna disappear. With time, and I says I never did, and I says uh, every time I brought this up, uh, they say, well, in the discharge it says you were okay when you went discharge. It's marked right on on your records. Well, I says, look, in those days they didn't have any audiologists, they didn't have any equipment to check hearing aid. I says this guy could not do nothing for me if he wanted to. I don't know this is how his way of getting out of it, but I said, I'm telling you that I have the problem. I said, the, the VA itself at this time, maybe about 10, 15 years ago, they were checking me. They finally, they, they, I, I've had since I come out of service seven pairs of hearing aids. None of them work. They gave me a pair of digital, which I have upstairs on the, on the desk there. They put this onto me thinking that that would remedy it, and it doesn't. And they think at this moment that I'm, 
it's, it took care of me. It's just I can't put two cords in my ear. I don't hear no more. When I put those hearing aids on, you know, and then you get a sound, the sound disappears, and it, they set them up. They work for about a day or two, and then they go flat. So they never wanted to warrant me on a hearing aid, on a hearing, bad hearing. I, I lost 35% of my hearing. And at this present, I have in Washington, at, I used to have this in the Principe Court. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I asked to be reviewed and all that. Right now, it's in the court of the new guy that's in charge. Uh, and uh, they're still fighting, and they never awarded me nothing. They give me 100% for my problem. But the hearing was part of that. And they tried to, they never wanted to award, award me anything for it. So, since anything, everything that happens in combat, they have to reward you some money, okay? And they finally took me down here, they passed me through, they, they said, they sent me to comp exam, they said, yes, this, they had outside doctors telling me, yes, this man had a hearing problem from combat. It shows it. They gave it to the VA, and still they never wanted to award me. This is why the case is in the Principal Court. And I'm waiting. Jim Nicholson is, is the new uh, charge of the VA. And I'm sure that he'll be looking at this case because everything that goes into the Principal Court. See, when it, first of all, I go, the, the case goes to the, the VA here, and they say, well, we can't do nothing. You send it to Washington, I go to the, 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 uh, the, the Veterans' Appeal. Uh, the DA, the Department of Veterans Appeal, there were lawyers in Washington. Once they decide, they can't decide, then they put it in the Principal Court. Now it's out of the VA system, it goes into the big court. Now they review it there, and then if whatever they decide, like the last time they put a remand on it, they push it back to, uh, to the uh, Board of Veterans Appeal, and they remanded it back to Hartford. When it comes to Hartford, I went down to see them because they had sent me a, a letter about it. And I said, well, what, 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 what's going to happen? They said, nothing. They said, you lost. I said, how can I lose if, if they remanded it? That means they didn't decide it. But they said, you have to reappeal. So I reappeal a second time. Probably, probably never happened. Probably never happened. But uh, the VA has treated me well besides that. Did you I go get, to any reunions? No. I never went to any reunions. Uh, I, I really wanted to, but uh, I was always caught in a way that uh, there was always something that interfered and couldn't leave and so forth. Now that uh, since uh, the last 10 years, I'm unstrapped more to the house than ever because of the fact my wife has Alzheimer's and I have to stay near her all the time. I'm actually her supporter and I do she can't walk, well, she can't, uh, there's certain things she can do, she can't cook no more. Um, she can do the bed and something, sometimes she helped me with the dishes, but you know, uh, she does wash and she takes good care of herself. So uh, the doctors told, one doctor said she, she had Alzheimer's and then the same office, a younger doctor said she didn't. It was uh, just lost her memory. But it's, it comes back to Alzheimer's or whatever. The only difference is the real case of Alzheimer's, they go down quicker on it. And when you, in my wife's stage, she could go on, you know, until she probably passes away. And it, Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I'm a, I'm a disabled American veteran. I, I'm, a, I'm a service officer for them. That means I file cases to, for, for other veterans. And uh, I'm also uh, the adjutant for Chapter 52, uh, Disabled American Veteran. And, and where's that located? Uh, in Enfield. Enfield, Connecticut? Yep. And when did you join the DAV? Back in 1946. Oh, you joined right away. Mm -hmm. You've been a member ever since? Yep. After I come out of the service, I joined. Are you a member of any other veteran organization? Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I have a life membership with the DAV and also with the uh, American Legion. Uh, I belong with the VFW for a while, long while with them. 
uh, I like the Disabled American Veteran more because uh, uh, it's more advanced. Like uh, they're into the well, I mean the disability, and this is what the, the organization is about. So what I like, what I like about it is the fact that I had a chance to be a service officer. And uh, well, I I interview all the officers like you're interviewing me. Uh, I get the case ready and I send them down to to, uh, to the uh, to my boss, which is uh, the AV down in uh, in Newington, and he's in the VA office. <coughs> so he takes the case from there and he walks them into the VA. And I've been very uh, lucky to help a lot of guys out there were in bad trouble, and they got themselves a good pension and some help. And I, a lot of guys think that. It's very difficult because I, I have my own problems that I can't accomplish because of the, the way it's set up. And yet I can go and help somebody else and he can come out a lot better than I have. <laughs> but the VA has been kind to me because they, I, see I have these chairs to go upstairs and downstairs right mm -hmm. there. And, and that's some, and this chair here, they gave me, I have a, a wheelchair outside they gave me and I have a push guard if I need it. The only thing I can't get from them, I'm trying to get a scooter because I explained to them that in the summertime, I have a lot of good friends up the neighbor up here. If I walk up there, it's killing me, you know. So I'll suffer for a long time if I do. Uh, if what I do, I have a lawnmower, it's a tractor. I get onto that, and I roll down. Then I look kind of. A lot of people ask, "How come you come down with a tractor? Can't you get a scooter from the VA? Does the VA give you it? No, they don't." I said, you know, would you believe what the VA knowing told me that unless I had a heart problem? I said, I have uh, what they call a filibration of the heart, a spike that, that comes on in my, uh, if you put me on a machine, you see a spike come on now, you know, higher than the other. So, but they, they treat me for that and so forth, but they don't call it a heart, a heart problem. And uh, the, the girl in the, uh, Newington says, uh, said the therapist, she says, well, she says, unless you have a heart problem. I says, well, I says, it's not the heart that's bad. I said, it's my legs and my back. And I said, well, you can't do it. Now I'm, I moved out of Newington. I'm up in Springfield. And I think they told me up there that they were going to get me a scooter. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. This now, summer I would have one. What was your career after the service? You were an electrician? An electrician. I was an electrician from Pratt when they, uh, I said, 27 years. And then uh, when I retired in 1989, and I worked with uh, a friend of mine, a small contractor, electrical contractor, I worked with him for a while. And then I decided to take my retirement. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't stop, you know. I was I, I was this kind of a guy who was always agitated, you know. Being an electrician, that you have to be that way. Well, what was happening, well, the reason I took early retirement, I kept falling off ladders with my legs. I fell down two or three times, I landed up the hospital five, six days, crack on the ankles and everything else. So I, one day, I, they wanted to get, uh, they wanted to lower, they took too many guys, they wanted to get, lay them off. And I went to them and I, I asked them, I said, would you lay me off <laughs> and give me the package that you have? And they said, well, you had 27 years. Yeah, if you want to do that, but we'd like to keep you here. My boss didn't want to let me go. So after a while, my boss said, look, he says, you've been very good to me. He says, I have to tell you that. So he says, I know you want to go. But he says, I'll, I'll sign the papers and we'll get you going. So, so I, you retired after 27 years. Yeah. Now, after the war, you got married, and did you have children? Yeah, I, two, I had a set of twins, my first ones. A boy, a boy and a girl, yeah. And then uh, I went on to about 15 years later, and then another girl came in. Uh, my, my daughter, Sandra, uh, was born after 15. My wife had, had gone to the doctor. She, she, didn't, she didn't feel well. She didn't know what was wrong with her, you know. Never thought in it that she would be pregnant. And when they told her that, she says, what? 15 years I'm pregnant? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you are. So you have three children? Yeah, I've had three. Two girls and a boy. So my son is an electrician. He's followed my footsteps. My daughter is a nurse in, uh, in Rhode Island, Bristol, Rhode Island. And my other daughter lives in uh, 
uh, Wallingford, and uh, she has two children. They all had, they, all my family has kids. I mean, my daughter from Rhode Island, she she had two. How many grandchildren do you three. have? Huh? How many grandchildren do you have? I have three, and Carl has three, six, seven, eight. I think about eight, I guess, eight, nine, ten. Maybe about ten anyway. Oh, I think your wife might have told me nine. Nine, that's it. That's close. How did your service and your military experiences affect your life? How did they explain to me? How did it affect your life? What the... What your combat experience did, how did that affect how you lived afterwards? Well, uh, what it affected me is the fact that uh, oh, how do I answer that? Uh, the combat experience it was something that I had to fight for a long time to try to forget. To, be, to become normal. This is the real world. You have it sounds it sounds bad, but uh, and I believe I, I've had in between the time that I left the service. I mean, while in Pratt Winnie, I had a nervous breakdown. And, and the nervous breakdown was caused because they were doing uh, work with machinery that had very high sounds a lot. And they used to go in my ear, they'd drive me crazy and drive me crazy, and I couldn't do anything about it. I had to live that way. And finally, I, one day I come out of there with my hands up and I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I had a nervous breakdown. I went home. I think I was about two months, maybe a little over two months, and I just couldn't hack it. So uh, it affected me pretty bad, and it took me a little while to get out of that, that nervous breakdown. And once I got down, it sort of, that sort of opened my eyes a lot more. I, I think it was a relief because there was so much pressure that was built. And it all came out in that time. Like, but I didn't want to go to work no more, and it was so bad that I, I couldn't face it. So I, sh I knew the problem came from there. But I, ne I needed to have that to live. So finally, I tried to go back in. I probably stayed stay there a couple of days, and I walked out. <laughs> they know me, so they walked me. But I kept doing that, and all of a sudden, I had a hard time to stay there for eight hours, but I did it, and I was able to accomplish it. And then, not long after, they wanted me to come to a fuel cell which they own in South Windsor. So I was away from all that noise and I got into a good environment. So that changed a lot right there. Again, and my mind, my nerves were at least at ease. But they, uh, I, I had a struggle, and till this day, I still have some feelings of it. But I have a new doctor in Springfield, and she's a Russian doctor, Dr. Love. L U V. What a nice lady she is, and she she told me she says I'm going to send you to uh, to the big hospital in Massachusetts up here, and we're going to uh, give you evaluation. I'll be able to help you a lot more. At the at Newington, they were Newington is so bad now; it's not even funny. I mean, I did that for 15 years, and I stopped going. I can't take it anymore. They don't; they're not interested in you that much. You go talk to a some uh, doctor, the guy can't even speak good English, you can't understand what he's saying, I have a human problem on top of that. But if you couldn't understand him anyway, that this was a complaint. And yet one time you go to see one, and the next time the person is gone, and somebody else, and I'm not good outside. I just got out of I go to Springfield and I love it. Right. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about your war experiences that we haven't covered? Well, the only thing I like to experience uh, I would have been very successful uh, in the Army, and I would have got big promotions. Uh, I would have probably gone to stars and staff sergeant and so forth. But because I was not graduated, it was always a down, a down thing for me. So when I left the service, I was a little angry at myself. It, 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 just because of the fact that I, would have, I didn't, it wasn't graduated and so forth, and I said, I'm a nobody, I'm going to be somebody. Uh, this is why when I went to this place, I was able to, to, to start me in 
I, I didn't know nothing about the Christie. My boss asked, he said, what do you know about the Christie? And I said, I don't even know why a light bulb lights up. He started laughing. He says, I like you. He said, you're honest. He said, I'm going to make an electrician. And he knew he was here. He said, you don't know your stuff. And boy, he was. But he wasn't laughing anymore because when he trained me, he was getting tough assignments. He was talking rough. And I'd be trying to bend a piece of pipe because I was going to put some special in it. And he come by and look at it. And he said, what are you doing there? So I tried to say, that's not the way to do it. I need to pull out my hand. There it is. That's what you do. You walk away from me. So that, that made me angry. So I tried harder. But this was my... My goal. I tried hard and I succeeded. And when I became full electrician, he told me, he said, You're the best electrician I have in this group. And he had 12 guys. He said, I'm telling you, I'm honest to believe this. I can trust you and you do your work right. You're clean and you're nice. And he says, he, They gave me a letter, it was unbelievable, to compliment me. And he said, I want you to go in the big tanks to change. Don't stay here. It's always going to be the same thing. You know all about it. Go away, you're going to learn more. So I came to Connecticut and I got involved with the aircraft. So that was a different type of electrical. They have 12 different kinds of electricians in the aircraft. All different ones. I went to all of them. I wow. Took, uh, and you know, they had the one from the, 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 the engine, where they test the engine, you troubleshoot those. I became a troubleshooter. When I, I was on maintenance, I was on construction, and I go on maintenance, on maintenance, I was a troubleshooter. I learned to do that. I was one of the best. But every time I had a machine, a brand new machine came in that didn't work no more electrically, they gave it to me. I got there, and no time at all. It, I, you know, and I was good at it. And I always tried better because I, I said, everything I'm going to do is, is going to be right. Because then I took, after uh, I took my, li uh, I went to take the state exam to get my license. I had no school background, but I know what I was. You know. <coughs> I took my first exam and I, I didn't pass it. That made me mad. I said, the next time I come here, I'm going to know this. I, I read that book that thick. I read it. Then after that, you could ask me a question, bam, it was there. I went to take it. I think I come up about 96 on 100. And if you had around 80, they pass you. <coughs> so they like a boot. And I had guys in there that had gone to colleges, and they couldn't make it. And I understand that you did eventually get your high school diploma. Yes, I did. What year was that? Uh, uh, 2001. 2001, you were awarded a high yep. school diploma from yep. Suffield High School? Yep. And that was, uh, they did it. Well, in fact, there was only two of us <laughs> graduated. They had all the children from all the schools that they have. They made a big party for. Well, I, I thought I was for. I was just 10, 15 guys out there. My whole family came over and all that. And it was only me. There was only one more little girl. And I, I looked at the little girl and I said, "What was this?" And he told me that she had uh, asked Governor Rell if she could have her fa her grandfather's discharge, I mean, uh, his, his graduation. And she said, yes. She says, when they graduate in, in Suffield, well, you will take your diploma from your grandfather. Because she said, you wanted it so much. He says, you don't have a, a, a graduation this year or nothing. That's how he said that. So then when they gave us my graduation, the little girl, uh, the school children came over uh, and like seat was in the they, they, they arm, they walked in, they brought me on the stage. I went to the graduation process to give my diploma. And the little girl went to her, she had the, the diploma, and then that's when I found out that she was taking a diploma for her grandpa. It was so nice. They treated us, they had the bands there, they had all the official in town, you know. And I always said that I would do something back to repay those children. And what happened is I was the first guy that had an interview like you gave me today. And uh, the guy that was doing it, he never produced anything. He, didn't, he took two or three, and he never gave us any copies or anything. And I wanted a copy to go into my school at the library, 
so the kids could have in the school to look at, because they're very interested in veteran affairs. And uh, I, 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 I haven't been able to do it yet with this particular guy, because he's, he's just that close to He was put in charge of doing this, and I don't know what he did. Well, we're going to get you a copy of this interview for you. Yeah, when I take a copy from you, I will get a copy. I'll, I'll make a copy somehow, and I'll give it to, uh, the, uh, to the first selectman. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, she will put it into the library if she be happy to. And then I understood that uh, the college in uh, an empty, they were much, very much interested to to get the veteran to come over and do the same thing as you. Uh, I think I was asked once, and I, I, I declined for the simple reason that uh, at that time, when I was asked before I, I did it with this guy. When I did it with this guy, I moved down while I was doing it. I couldn't help myself. I saw the hits on some number of others. Uh, I'm not tough on these things. And uh, I was crying, and uh, I didn't know. And then it, after I got done, I told him, I, I, uh, the guy that the guy that's making the movie, he said, you know, I said, I never wanted to get involved around things like this, just because of the fact that I'm very emotional and this and it hits me like this. And so don't worry about it. He says, uh, uh, we have ways of working this out. I, I think he took about a two, a two hour interview. And of course, it, they snip out what they want to make it come out right. Uh, then there was a lady from the Hoppy Current that seen it. My copy, as the first one. She says that that's the most beautiful video that I've seen in a long time on World War II. She says, you look just excellent. She called me excellent. She said, I could see that bronze stars of you shining. She says, <laughs> and she says you, uh, that's a remarkable man, she says. And she says, I'm so happy. She says, I, I'm going to talk, talk to you my, your first select lady, Elaine Sarsinski, a very nice lady. And I tried to get them to get a program going and try to get that moving. And uh, this is the reason why I try to I try not to get involved because I was always scared to uh, break down and so but I get a little trouble when I when I talked to you, I got used to it the first time. I know what I tried to pull myself back, you know. Well, Lou, you don't have to. But I appreciate you giving me the interview and I I wanna thank you for your service to our country. Well, I, 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 uh, it was just like, uh, if you have to understand veterans, uh, like I give a lot to the veterans now. And uh, by giving a lot to them, I'm giving a lot to their families. Because they depend on the poor condition and the health. And that's what the, the benefits are working for them. They keep thanking the United States. It's, you don't have to, but all we have to do is let me know you got something that you make me very happy. That's the way that it is all the time. You, see, you don't have to worry about anything. But I have one now that I'm working with. And she comes from war to uh, Korea. He came World War II. He's been trying to get his benefits and stuff. And right now I'm on the verge of getting his benefits. And I think about five, five, six weeks from now, I know that I will have it for him. And he's so tickled pink that he's... He's 80 years old. Wow. I'd like to thank you for your service to our other veterans. I take him to the hospital. helped a lot of them. I take him to the hospital when he needs to get checked out. You know what I'm I wheel him in and everything else. I do all I'm not supposed to do that. I do it kind of because he was in, he's in my group as a, a member. And you're that. And no one, you don't want to help him. His brothers don't even talk to him. Nice man. Never got married. That's nice man. And I, I came over here, the nurse brought him over here, then my officer was in and took all his records. So I took care of that. Okay, I'm going to go back there. And I want to thank you for doing this for me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.